What's your sweet spot and in what kinds of businesses do you like to invest? Well, so we, we have a team of six partners here. So three of us on the life sciences side and three of us on the tech side. And in technology, um, we're fairly old fashioned in many ways, which right. is that we invest at seed or series A. Right. We always, we like to take generally a, a sort of lead role and really partner meaningfully with the companies that we back. And then we'll look for, you know, high upside, highly scalable, highly ambitious entrepreneurs that we can work with and, and build businesses with over time. So we're old fashioned in the way that we believe in, you know, real leadership, really owning a decent chunk of a company, really partnering with entrepreneurs. Um, and then we try and be new school in the sense that we try and be, you know, transparent and honest and fast and have a lot of uh, the brand qualities that I think the entrepreneurs are looking for in terms of finding an open-minded, evidence-driven, pragmatic partner uh, that's willing to, to do some real work with them. Fantastic. And I know that um, I've been following your blog for a, a few years and I know that you're, um, you do write some amazing stuff um, and some great exposés in the past. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate that. I think a lot of the issues we're faced with sometimes are down to uh, um, inappropriate communication or a, a perceived lack of transparency. Yes. And I think I'm really trying, really trying to fight that by being as, as open and as frankly as candid as I can yes. around, around um, you know, the entrepreneur versus VC relationship or the entrepreneur versus angel relationship, whichever form that might be. Yes, and, and it just encourages so much trust in the community, um, that sort of transparency. Thank you. What percentage of women startups do you get pitches for, and what percentage have you funded? Well, so we um, we were running an event here uh, recently in um, in Boston, which is a we do founder events and then we do CEO events. So this right. one going to be a CEO event, and it's either people we've backed or it's people who've made money, or it, they tend to be sort of more mature types. Right. And uh, we had Scott Kirsner from Boston Globe and. Uh, he was there talking about um, the necessity of having a more diverse ecosystem in Boston, what Boston could do better. And suddenly, I, I semi-interrupted him and kind of stood up and said, listen, by the way, there's 50 of us in the room here, and there's only one woman. Oh. <laughs> and it turns out I invited her, and I'm the newcomer to the scene. You know, it was uh, Gina Ash from, from Crush oh. was there. Um, and, and she was the only the only uh, female entrepreneur in the room. So I think there is a long, long way to go. I mean, there was a, sort of a striking evidence, but it's, yes. it's, uh, it is rare and continues to be rare, no question. Yes. Now, if you're asking how many we funded, so we do have a few. Uh, we have, in fact, some phenomenal um, uh, female execs. Uh, so I backed Helene Monat at AdSafe Media. Um, who, who's really been there since the start and helping structure that firm. Right. Um, we have backed uh, Mara on, at Onquity here in Boston, uh, who's a, a life sciences business focused on, on um, uh, cure for cancer, and in particular the uh, circulating tumor cells in, in the human body. So wow. she's a female exec. She's a you know, fairly dominant uh, type of CEO and a, and, a, and a great performer. So wow. we have a few. But I mean, just like everybody else, I would say that it remains the, the minority. Um, and it's true both if you look at the venture funds as well as looking at the companies that are backed, which I think is part of the problem. Yes, um, as Mark Suster said, it's a numbers game, I think. Have you noticed differences with women entrepreneurs in how they pitch and build businesses? Well, so I think it is very difficult do not fall into broad generalizations when you're trying to answer that question, frankly. Thank you. And I, to a certain extent, almost don't want to insult the women that I work with. And yes. Pigeonhole them. I will say one thing, though. Um, let's take PayPal for, an, for as an example. Yes. And there is a good body of evidence that says PayPal became such a fabulous company because it had a lot of diversity. Uh -huh. Diversity in the sense of you know, sometimes complex talents with people coming from very different walks of life. So Elon Musk who went on to create um, uh, the electric car company whose name is escaping me. Tesla. Right. Thank you, Tesla. <laughs> uh, 
the rest of the team were highly varied, had a highly varied background. Right. There is a recognition, uh, a recognition, sorry, that richness comes from diversity and that, you know, you really need, especially in the age we live in, where there's a lot of lateral thinking that happens between biology, chemistry, IT, etc. Yes. You need a lot of lateral thinking, you need different ways of doing things. The only certainty is the lack of certainty. In other words, we live in a world of continuous change. And diversity is the best response you can have to that. So I would just consider that having, you know, female people within your company, having women you can work alongside is a mm. strong factor of diversity. Mm. And I'm just amazed that more people don't kind of leverage that more. Yes, I, I interviewed a um, woman entrepreneur this morning and she said, you know, basically that it's a reflection of what what's out there in the world, which is gender diversity. So if you have that within your company, then you can um, target your markets uh, in a more balanced way, which I thought was a, a really good point. Um, Cindy Gallup, founder of If We Ran the World, said in a recent interview, um, VCs fund in their own image, white male, the cycle is self-perpetuating, so predominantly male. VCs have a preconceived notion in their heads of what they think constitutes the kind of entrepreneur to back. John Doerr apparently said if you're a white, under 30, tech geek with no social life and a Harvard Stanford dropout, line up for VC money. He didn't say male, but he might as well have. If it had been a 17-year-old Russian girl who came up with chat roulette, would there have been as much interest in funding whatever she might do next? So what's your take on this, Fred? And if, if this is happening, how can women startups find an opening in this culture? Well, um, so the venture world probably favors a style of leadership that is uh, highly directional. Okay. In other words, most of the time, I mean, it depends how well your board listens, but a bunch of the boards I've been involved with are basically uh, uh, an environment where influence matters a lot. Okay. And where people expect you to show extremely strong direction. And um, the, a lot of times you're basically faced with four or five, you know, white males like Stanford and Harvard, whatever they yep. may be, who are expecting a lot of direction. And so it is not a natural environment where if you don't belong to that world, whether you're a female or whether you're Russian or both, yeah. <laughs> and it's particularly easy to express yourself because there are almost unwritten rules of the game as to Gosh. how you manage these environments. Now, I think the good news is we're moving to a world where, I mean, look at the work that Brad Feld has done. Or yes. <laughs> You're moving to a world where there is a lot more acceptance of our own ignorance. And I always, I always posit ignorance as a starting point. In other words, I'm not sure what's going to work, but I'm, um, I'm for sure going to measure it. But you know, I don't know at the outset what the recipe is for success because I don't think there is one. Right. I think there is a lot more open-mindedness that should help. Uh, you know, female leadership style maybe has more to do with building consensus with uh, being a, a, you know, a leader that is accepted by uh, skills and, and ability to take input, etc. So it's maybe a less obvious style of leadership, but very often maybe more efficient, mm -hmm. but not one that people are used to within the venture environment. Now, okay. of course, people fund within their zones of comfort. Um, yes. you know, the, the, the venture game is so much about long-term trust relationships and whether you fall in love with the project, the people running it, and whether you know you have the feeling you're going to be able to count on them. Yes. And so anything that is a strong affiliation, whether it's, you know, I recognize myself younger, we come from the same university, whatever it may be, and it helps people get over these hurdles. Yes. It's a challenge that the venture industry has to embrace, which is, hey, you know, there's actually a lot of ideas that are way outside of your normal comfort zone and that may deliver outsized returns, but don't come from these... Uh, typical profile and you know maybe maybe women fit that mold too yes so encouraging them to be a little bit more at risk or adventuresome <laughs> okay well, I think I think I'll tell you what I what I would say generally speaking yes I think when you're um, when you're going into entrepreneurship and you're going to meet entrepreneurs the women that I've seen do best yes are women who are absolutely willing to embrace who they are Wow. So there is absolutely no attempt 
at being tougher than the boys or whatever it may be. In fact, you use femininity, frankly, and female characteristics, you know, just as a, to that full. I mean, you're just not ashamed to be a woman. You absolutely are who you are. You'll dress the way you feel like dressing. Mm. That gives you inner confidence to be more yourself in these environments. And ultimately, if you can't be yourself and you can't make it without, um, without faking who you are, you'll never make it. And so I think we moved very far away from an environment where it was recommended that women try and fit into a certain mold. I think in the world of entrepreneurship, a Katharina Fake or Gina Ash or whoever it may be are very complete personalities. You know, they're very wholesome personalities. And, and mm. every instance of a, a successful women entrepreneur that I can think of are people who embrace who they are. And by the way, the same is true for a geek. If you're a geek, don't pretend to be a businessman. You know, yeah. go to business as a geek. Yeah, yeah. And it's about embracing your inner actor in a way. Mm. Um, you go and pitch to VCs, and when you go and, and and play and play the game of being an entrepreneur, I think <laughs> it's difficult enough that if you can't fully be yourself, you'll never make it. So might as well completely embrace who you are, and <laughs> what's idiosyncratic about you, yes. and turn it into a strength. Yes, that's so encouraging and inspirational. Thank you. Cindy also says, I think not as many women as men actively seek VC money because they're not as tapped into the boys' network as male entrepreneurs are. Young male entrepreneurs can very easily become the flavour of the month and get introduced around from one VC to another, get the perception going after going that, that they're hot and get their funding. It doesn't happen for women that way. Do you think that networking with venture capitalists is harder for women entrepreneurs? I've never really thought about that angle. Um, I think the US market, which I'm new to, yes. um, is very much trusted by Stanford and Harvard. Uh, mm -hmm. If you mapped the VC population back to these two organizations, you probably find that you know upwards of 50% of practitioners come out of that school. Um, so I can surely see why that would be a definite advantage. I would, however, tend to discount that argument a little bit because I think, you know, fundamentally, most people within our world want to help entrepreneurs. You know, despite all the bad press that may have been out there. Yes. Um, you know, people do this job because they like entrepreneurs, they want to interact with them, they want to help them build a business. Correct. You know, whether you're a male or a female, I mean, I don't know, who cares? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and you want to be a bit, uh, if I can turn the argument on its head about the old boys network. Yes. You know, if you're a charming woman and, you know, people like interacting with you because you're a charming woman, that can be an advantage too. And maybe <laughs> I'm speaking out of school here, but, you know. <laughs> I mean, yeah. The fact that the fact that you bring a different flavor can be could be yeah. an advantage too, as far as I could see. Yeah. Thank you. That's really great.